Welcome, welcome. Genesis 22 is what we're going to be going over today. This, if you're not aware, I mean, I wasn't aware until I read the title, is Abraham's test. Otherwise, when Abraham's told to sacrifice Isaac, obviously this is one of those topics where people can jump all over the Bible like, that's sadistic. But again, that's a pretty shallow understanding. It's someone who clearly didn't even read the story. It's like they saw the first couple sentences of a synopsis and they're like, oh, but we'll get into it in this study here. Let's start off just 22, verse 1, King James Version. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. So, understand, first of all, tempt means test. He's trying to see if Abraham is worthy. This is, again, I mentioned this before, a lot of times in the Bible, verse 1 of a chapter will say what's happening, and then they'll tell a story of how that happened. It's like, here's what's happening in this chapter, and here's how it all happened. And that's what's going on here. So it came to pass after all these things that happened in the previous chapters, after uh, the, all these covenants made and the peace agreements with the Philistines and Canaanites in the area, and when after Isaac been born and weaned and all this stuff, and Ishmael and Hagar had gone, been sent on their way. So now, after he's been living a good life for a chunk of change of time here, this is when he's tested. When things are going their best, this is when the test comes. Doesn't this sound like every life lesson we've ever learned? <laughs> you know, things are going great. Something's going to happen that's going to test you. Are you going to keep doing what's right when things get hard? Or are you going to be like, hey, whoa, things aren't easy. I'm not on easy street anymore. So this, maybe I should change my ways. And that's what God's going to see is going if Abraham is going to make that decision or if he's going to make the decision like in Job where he keeps worshiping God. Also, I, I find it funny. I'm pretty sure it's Abraham. So God did tempt Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. I think it's Abraham saying, Here I am, because God said, Abraham. Or, But, I mean, I looked up like four different commentaries on this, and there's differing opinions. I don't know if it's God saying, Here I am, or if it's Abraham answering God saying, Here I am. I like to think that... All I know is it reminds me of the burning bush, where he's like, I am who I am. That's all I think of when I see it. So I tend to think that this that's God, but it doesn't matter really. Either way, God's like, hey, Abraham's like, yeah. <laughs> but the whole I am thing is it's just cool. I think that's a cool entry. Like, that is God. I am who I am. I love that. Verse 2. And he said, take that now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moria, sounds like something from Lord of the Rings, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. What? Like, that's got to be like what Abraham's thinking. What? Uh, crap. Notice how he said, your son, your only son, your son that thou lovest. This is the joy of he and Sarah's life. This is their only begotten son together with a woman that he truly loves. They truly love one another. And they have this son that's wonderful. A wonderful kid. And they've had him for years. We don't know the age exactly of Isaac, which shows that that's not really important. But we'll get into my best. He's definitely between like 5 and 36. I mean, that's a big gap. Basically a 30-year gap. I tend to think he's in his teens to like late teens, typically. Maybe early 20s. And we'll get into why I think that, but just know he's older than five, probably over 10, and younger than 36. And they, he loves him more than anything. Years, that's why, because sometimes when your son gets real old, you kind of don't like him. So that's why I think he's like just a really good teenager at this time. Loves him more than anything. He's the joy of his world, joy of his life, joy of his wife's life, who he also loves. So it's not only going to hurt him, but it's going to hurt his wife as well. And you understand, this is what all the other people around, like Moloch, the bowler, or sometimes an owl god, that people would 
offer their kids to, at the time, all the people around them are doing this in a burnt offering. They'd offer their children to this God. Now they're doing it for reward, for glory, for riches. God's saying, do it for me. Things are already good. Like you don't need to sacrifice your son for it to be good. Do it for me. Oof. Basically, he's seeing, are you worthy? He's not promising power. He's already made the covenant with him that his seed is going to make all these things. Abraham's like, wait, am I going to have another son? What's going on here? Because the promise has already been made that his line will be a blessing to the world. There will there'll be great nations among the world. So if he's killing his only son, the son that God said would be his line, is he like, okay, so wait, is it Ishmael? But that means he lied. But none of this, I mean, I'm sure it crossed his mind, but he accepts the challenge. That's what you need to understand. He accepts the challenge. Though he loves his son, though it's the joy of his world and he doesn't understand everything that's going on, he has been proven time and time again that God is loving, righteous, and just. And we'll get into his total righteousness because it's a testament to God's total righteousness what ends up happening in this story. But understand, that's what God wants to see. How much do you believe that I am a righteous God? I've proven to you time and time again, but do you really believe it? What's the biggest thing that I, you could do to show me? Now, obviously, God knows already what's in Abraham's heart. The point of the story is for Abraham to realize it and then for us to learn from the lesson. And you know, spoiler alert, he doesn't kill his son. God would never allow that. That's how we know God's a righteous God. Like we wouldn't even follow the Bible if he did sacrifice his son. <laughs> We'd be like, oh, he's not righteous. Like, I remember Game of Thrones, Davos, Sir Davos, the Onion Knight in the show says something like uh, to the red priest when she burns that girl. He's like, your God told you to sacrifice a child? Your God's evil. <laughs> like, obviously God doesn't allow him to sacrifice, and that's the point of the story. Like I said, if you didn't read the whole story, you wouldn't get the point. So we know that he's a righteous God. He would never allow this. And now Abraham, we can see the message. The message is, love nothing above me. Know that I will always be righteous and just and true and loving. I mean, you can't be just if you're not righteous. You can't be righteous if you're not just. You can't be righteous or just if you're not loving. You just can't. You can't be those things without the other one. And God can't be God without being all three, which he is at all times. This shows his total righteousness. Okay, show me that you're willing to sacrifice the thing you love the most and that your spouse loves the most. Show me that you're willing to do it not for glory or for gain, but because you believe that my will is the true will, the righteous will of the world, of everything. I mean, again, it's a you're like, this. that's so insane. Of course it's insane. If it was something simple, it wouldn't be a glory. It wouldn't be anything. It would be like, hey, sacrifice that sheep. Okay. <laughs> hey, sacrifice your like prize bowl. Or, like, your most productive heifer. Like, even that stuff's like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> no, sh the thing you love the most. What do you love the most? You love your son the most, obviously. Are you willing to sacrifice him? Because I, who have proven to be righteous, tell you to. Again, God doesn't ask him, or doesn't actually have him do it. It's a test. And he's never asked anyone to do anything like that ever again. And if... He did, he would stop them before they did it, just like he does here. You might be like, what if he doesn't get there in time? He's God, okay? He'd get there in time, like he does. But understand, that's what's going on. What do you love the most? Do you love it more than God? Do you believe God is truly righteous? Okay. We'll see if you truly love him more than anything and truly believe in his righteous will. Verse 3, I got hung up on that, but that's so important to understand. I've said understand many times, but it's very important to get that in your head. What do you love the most? Do you love God the most? And also, we'll get into it more, God is always righteous. Do you believe that? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son 
and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then the th on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So three days it takes him to get there. What a solemn journey. Now, I well, Isaac doesn't know what's going on. None of the people know what's going on other than Abraham. They probably stop him if they did. So are they just chit-chatting? And they're like, man, why is Abraham in such a bad mood? Like, there's no way he's in a cheery mood. His son probably is. Like, I just picture such an awkward three-day journey. Like, what is up with Abraham? It'd be like hanging out with... Oh, I'm such a nerd. Whatever. It'd be like hanging out with Ned Stark from Game of Thrones. Just like, no conversation going on here. <laughs> what an awkward travel. That's all I can think on that. So they get to this place. Three days in, Abraham sees this is the mountain God shows him. Because he said he wasn't going to tell him where until later on. Okay, cool. They get there. says, the two servants, you stay here. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon... Isaac, his son, so he made his son carry the wood, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <laughs> Isaac's not a dummy. I really tend to think he's like mid to late teens in this. I mean, he's old enough to carry all the wood for the burnt offering. He's old enough to notice, but he's not too old. Like 20 to 30, he'd be like, what is going on here? You know, maybe not, but I tend to think he's in his teens and when this is going on. He's able to carry it, but he also notices. He's like, uh, hey, what's going on here? But he's still pretty innocent about it. That's why I think he's not later in life yet. Because in verse 8, we'll also understand Abraham's also been good. He's been the best man possible. So he's probably not thinking too suspiciously of this father who's proven time and time again to be like this extremely just and righteous man. But I love his response here. Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now again, he may be older, but I think that's like showing that he's in his teens. It's like, okay. Because to me, that's like a total dad answer. Like that's how you answer your child when they're asking questions that you don't really want to talk about. When it's like, what's sex? Oh, it's what uh, mommy and daddy do to make babies. Like answer them general boom. If they keep going into it, you just move on to the topic. Like you make sure it's a hard period at the end of the sentence. But it gives them enough information that they like, okay, you know, they can accept that. And that's what he did here. It's such a dead answer. Uh, God will provide it. Oh, yeah. All right. That's cool. Makes sense to me. I mean, God's like worked tons of miracles for you. I mean, so let's see what happens now. But also understand, Isaac was not around for a lot of these miracles. They weaned him. And not a whole lot miracle-wise is happening since Isaac has been born. Now, Abraham's proved himself to be a good father, a good righteous man. But Isaac hasn't really seen any of the wonders, per se. Verse 10. Yeah. Okay, now before I get into that. So, let me read verse 9 one more time. Oh, no, no, here. Yeah, it's getting verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told of him, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and said him, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So, either he's still young enough to be overpowered by Abraham, because Abraham's old at this time, or he's worn out from carrying the firewood. Either way, he's still able to be overpowered by his father. Or he's willing to go through with it. So it doesn't say here that Abraham told him, hey, you're the offering. So did Abraham force him down or did he willingly lay down? 
Now, he could have willingly laid down. Abraham could have told him he could have been such a man of faith that he willingly laid down. Abraham could have forcibly bound him. But I want to reflect on the book of Jasher. I believe it's, e it's either Jasher or Jubilee, which are non-canonical books. But these are things that, like, Christ would have known these stories. The stories from Jasher and these other non-canonical books. And he's never speaking out against them, so I don't really discredit them. I discredit them to the extent that they have to reflect back to the Bible, they have to match up with the Bible, and they do so well, so it kind of just backs up the Bible. A lot of them just give a little more detail to stories. And I think that's honestly why they're left out, because you don't put the extreme detail in like the history book for the students. Like You give good details, but it's always referencing other stuff you know, when you do that. And that's what the Bible is. It's like the history book of Christian, Judeo-Christianity, you know, through the years. But it, here's the stuff that you look into for more detail. And in the book of Jasher, when Isaac and Ishmael were still around each other, I, Ishmael was basically like bragging, saying that he did more of a sacrifice to God when he was circumcised, because he was circumcised as an adult. And, you know, this is Ishmael. And Isaac's like, I, Ishmael was an adult, but he's old enough to remember it and feel it. And Isaac had it done when he was like a baby. So he doesn't even remember the sacrifice that he made. And it was kind of worthless. And Ishmael's sacrifice was greater. And Isaac kind of combated at him like, I would give my life to the Lord if he asked of it. You know, that's how much I love the Lord. So God... It's kind of like calling him, call him, him on his bluff. And I tend to think Isaac willingly laid down. He knew that he had said those words. Or he knew that his father was so righteous that God had really told him this. But that's the story of Jasher. Is that Ishmael's like trash talking to him. Like, my, I, I, the tip of my penis cut off when I was an adult. It hurt. You were a baby. Didn't feel a thing. And Isaac's like, dude, I would give my life if God asked for it. So would you do that? Mm -hmm. And here, because I, I really think it's both Abraham and Isaac being tested. I really do. You know, it's the test of Abraham is what it's called. But Isaac is also being tested. You have to remember that. Abraham might have forcibly bound him, but I just don't think that's the case. You know, even if he's only like 15, he, his dad's like in his hundreds, you know. And this is not when they're living super long lives anymore. His dad's an old man. And his dad probably didn't want to like actually hurt him. More than likely, he did it willingly. But that's not really important to the point. But it kind of is. It kind of is because it shows that Isaac is willing to make the sacrifice. You know, that's why I hate that these things aren't really more well known. Isaac is willing, okay? I really think that that is the case. That he is, when they get there, he realizes what's going on. Now, he's young enough that maybe he would have you know, gotten scared on the way if he'd known on the way, and that's probably why he wasn't told. But at this certain point, he realized what's going on, and he either is like totally against it, fighting, 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 ah, la, 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 or he accepts it, which based on the relationship he and his father continue to have afterwards, no PTSD from the situation, based on the way that Isaac is blessed and Isaac continues to worship this God that asked him to be murdered, <laughs> Shows that he accepted it. It really does. So verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am, here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Okay, I talked about in the beginning. God wasn't going to let it happen. And if it did, we would know that that's not God. God is just righteous and loving. If he'd let Isaac die by a sacrifice to him, he wouldn't be God. <laughs> but he is God. That's what is so funny to me who people use this as an argument of like the evil Old Testament God. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Did you read the story? Do you have like this shallow of a mindset 
of when you read anything, you know, when you read any fantasy novel, are you just like looking at, <laughs> are you not reading into what's going on behind the scenes and what's actually happening here? It's ridiculous. He doesn't let it happen. Of course he was never going to let it happen. That's the whole point of God. The point of this story and what's going on is to show, because again, God already knows Abraham was going to be willing to do it. He knows what's in their heart. He also knew that Abraham was starting to live this lavish lifestyle. He was so blessed. He had his son who he loved more than anything. And God needed to remind him that, no, your son is not me. Anything of this world is not where your true desire and love should be. And Abraham was reminded of that, and he was willing to, and he show, willing to show that, okay, the thing I love the most in this world is yours, God, because you are what's most important. And God's like, that's, not, I know, now you know. Do you see? It wasn't, it was the test of Abraham. It wasn't the test of God. It was the test, the temptation of Abraham. Are you more obsessed with the things of this world than of me? No, I'm not. Prove it. I can prove it. Yes, that's right. And it was a reminder. I mean, maybe if this hadn't happened, I mean, Abraham might have started falling out, thinking, I don't need, you know, lazy lifestyle. Look what has happened to Solom Solomon, King Solomon, when he had all this money and riches and everything because he was so blessed because of years of righteous living. Now he starts falling into a lavish lifestyle of debauchery. Maybe that had happened to Abraham if this hadn't happened. The whole point of the story is that obviously God wasn't going to let it happen, but Abraham, and now people who read the story can also learn from it. Don't put your love of anything higher than your love of God. Fear God. And what it fear really means is respect God. Know that God is righteous, just, and loving. Know that. Know it in your heart. Because if he's not, then he's not God. But we know that true righteousness and true justice and true love is instilled in all of our genes. We can feel it. We can see it. We know it. Even people who choose not to do it, they still know it and see it. They just don't like it because they have given in to the evil ways. That's God. I'm not saying we're all, we can all be God, but we are touched with the breath of life. We have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We are able to see justice, righteousness, love, God. Moving on. Verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. God would provide. That's what he told Isaac. But whoo, like, right? Again, we wouldn't worship this God if he had let it happen. We wouldn't do it. Christianity would have never taken off. Judaism would have never taken off. It would have been some other religion. I mean, I'm sure God still existed, it's just this wouldn't be God. And it is God. So it doesn't let it happen. But it's like, dodge the bullet. I wonder how guilty, if Abraham felt guilty at all. I don't tend to think so, because A, God's literally talking to him. Isaac more likely was willing to go through it once he's, based on Jubilees and Jasher and all the other non-canonical books, and based on the fact that he doesn't seem to put up much of a fight at all, when this is going on, he's very accepting of everything. So, I don't think that there was much guilt between the two. I think they were deeper thinkers. More than likely, they did discuss everything that just happened going down that mountain back to their two aides. And then on the trek back home, they probably had many discussions. And they both came to an understanding and a realization that they need to keep God the foremost in their life. And that obviously God was never going to let it happen. That was never the intent. The intent, they saw the intent. Again, if Abraham didn't see the purpose of it afterwards, then he would have hated God for let, making him do that sort of thing. He was a deep thinker. He wasn't a shallow thinker. He thought deeply about the issue, discussed it with Isaac, saw what the purpose of everything was to keep God as the foremost, to know that he's always going to have our back, and he would obviously never let this happen. 
The whole point was for Abraham to learn from the situation about what was truly important, which is God. And they were probably both Abraham and Isaac were like, oh, this is such a powerful message. We need to hold on to this and carry on to this for the rest of our lives and give it to our sons and our ch daughters and our lineage for years to come. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord, you know? They realized what the point of it was. So there was like, and you'll see it later, there's no animosity. There's no PTSD going on. There's nothing like, oh, my father hated, you know, daddy issues or anything like that. They had a good relationship. They were willing to do the sacrifice together. Saw what the purpose of the sacrifice was. Saw that God obviously was never going to let them happen. Saw that they need to keep God and their respect and their love and their fear of God above all things. Even your family. That's why it's God family country or whatever afterwards, you know? God's first. Obviously, you want to love your family, and God's not going to ask you to kill your family. And if he does, it's not actually going to let it happen. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jehirah, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen or it shall be provided. So again, this ram shows up in the thicket. Or did I, yeah, yeah, I read that part. The ram's caught in the thicket, There's, and then they offer the ram up for the burnt offering. I'm not going to get into too much detail about it because I think there's way more other things to talk about. But there's a lot of good sermons out there talking about how crazy this actually is because of where they're located and the elevation and how rams don't go up that high. And it's not normal for a ram to be there, first of all. And then just the way it was caught in the thicket like that, obviously, right at the perfect timing, you know. So everything about it was a miracle. Like God led him there, knowing that there would be this ram there, knowing everything, you know. It just shows God's genius, really. And it's interesting little side note. But, like I said, it's not really a message thing. It's just like, cool, information. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and thou hast withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea. Sure, and thy seed shall possess the gates of the enemies. He's reaffirming the covenant again, okay? You'll be a blessing to the world. You'll multiply from as many stars are in the sky. That will be your lineage. They will just be everywhere, which is basically true. I mean, if you look at people's lineages, it's not, you know, the Jewish people intermingled throughout their history all over, and they became a blessing to the world because they brought us Christianity which is a blessing to the world. And really, a lot of early Jews became Christians. So Christianity like stole a lot of the like I, deeper thinkers from Judaism in the early years. <laughs> also, when it says uh, they'll own the gates of your enemies, gates is courts. Like You'll be in charge of the courts of your enemies because you will be seen as just and righteous and loving. I mean... Modern man and other cultures don't really care about the loving part. But again, you can't be just and righteous if you're not loving. And, I mean, we see it today. Jewish people are good lawyers. <laughs> There's a lot of judges. I mean, it's just their religion is basically the law and knowing and understanding and following the law. But what you need to understand is it's understanding justice and righteousness. So when they were judges in the Old Testament... People from other communities would come and ask them to judge situations. I mean, we see this in Solomon, you know, with the queen of Car Carthage or whatever coming over and wanting to know certain things and seeing his wisdom. And people are always asking Solomon for judgment calls. Excuse me. So people from other cultures are using them as their judges because it's not a law thing. I mean, these cultures have other laws. It's what's righteous, what's just. You guys are righteous and just. Because you're so righteous and just, we, you're going to be the courts of the world. You're going to be the gate holders of the world. But why are you righteous and just? Because you worship God, which is righteousness, justice, and love. 
That's why. Because you're not going to be concerned with earthly gains. Bribery and extortion and blackmail and all these things, they're going to bounce off you like your Teflon. Because you follow the Lord. Taking a bribe isn't righteous. Taking a bribe isn't just. So the Lord is righteous and just. Your religion is all about this Lord who is righteous and just. Therefore, you're going to be pretty good judges. <laughs> Verse 18. And in, this, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, which is in Israel. And Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. So there is no Israel at this time. It's just the land of the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all these other tribes. A lot of them basically are descendants of Ham's line from Noah. And uh, anyway, and Abraham is a descendant of Shem's line, the Asian line, believe it or not. Shem, Asian. Abraham, Asian. Which means Jesus is Asian. <laughs> All these pictures of white Jesus, or the talk of like black Jesus, you know, and everything. Jesus was Asian, guys. I mean, if you believe the Bible and you believe in Jesus, then you believe that Jesus is Asian. It says so in the Bible. So, <laughs> all right. So you'll be blessing all nations. Yeah, verse 20. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz... <laughs> his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Shesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Remua, she bare also Teba, and Gaham, and Thahash, and Makkah. So more genealogy stuff. I mean, I don't get too into the bloodlines thing. I get it, especially when it comes to prophecy. I'm not one of those total seed of the serpent, seed of the uh, woman people as far as, because, it, I mean, it doesn't matter which line you're from as far as genealogy goes because someone of this line can still be saved and someone of this line can still fall. So it do, that doesn't matter. What matters, what genealogy matters for, is prophecy. Okay. So look right there, and Rebecca is going to be Isaac's uh, wife. So that's kind of why I think this is getting brought up. But I'm not going to get all off on bloodlines things. They're interesting. They're fun to read about and learn about. But like, it's all over. Like David's mighty men and all this stuff, and Jesus come for the Gentiles. The bloodlines isn't important as far as being saved and not being saved. The bloodlines is important so you can fulfill prophecy. That's the point of the bloodlines. I mean, otherwise it's just a metaphor. Like the seed of the serpent are people who choose to live in sin. You know those people I was talking about who can see justice and righteousness, but it scares them. They don't like it, and they want to hide and destroy it get it away that's the seed of the serpent it has nothing to do with your bloodline you're the seed of the serpent if you choose to live that way you're seed of the woman if you choose to embrace christ and his teachings anyway god bless hope everyone has a wonderful evening